So this video is to accompany our newsletter on bone metastatic prostate cancer management. Uh, and in this issue, we have uh, David Crawford and Oliver Sarter uh, both uh, talking about their uh, views on management issues in um, bone metastatic uh, prostate cancer. Uh, and in it, I give an introduction that uh, fleshes out some um, other details. Um, so I'd like to touch on, on a few um, issues from that newsletter uh, that are suitable for this kind of uh, relaxed format. Uh, the first is we have really two bone scans, the regular technetium bone scan that's been around forever uh, and a sodium fluoride PET CT scan. Uh, and they're actually uh, Quite a diversity of opinion on this. Uh, there's, I think, no question that the sodium fluoride uh, scan is much more sensitive uh, and has a better signal to noise ratio, uh, so the picture ends up being clearer. Uh, the argument against the sodium fluoride scan is it may be too sensitive uh, and may have false positives. Now, that's not completely clear whether these are false positives or true positives. To really do that, you'd have to systematically uh, biopsy the bone lesions and document cancer's presence. Uh, the problem with that is you can biopsy a real metastatic bone lesion and just get bone cells back, and not uh, prostate cancer cells. When the cancer invades the bone and creates the typical uh, bone lesion, uh, half up to 90% of the cells in that lesion could be normal bone uh, reaction elicited by the cancer. So it's difficult to resolve this, this issue. Uh, so I use both scans when uh, I'm looking for a situation where I'm worried about false positives, I use a regular scan. But for example, when I want to declare a complete remission uh, in patients with bone metastatic disease, I'd rather have a scan that was too sensitive uh, and not miss things. Um, so I find myself using a lot of sodium fluoride bone scans. Um, and currently this is covered uh, by Medicare. Uh, the other insurance carriers vary and many of them don't cover it. So sometimes what we do is limited by uh, insurance. Uh, but if you want to make absolutely sure all the metastatic bone disease resolves, the, the sodium fluoride bone scan, because it's so sensitive, uh, does a better job, I think, uh, for that. Uh, another key issue uh, are blood markers to follow uh, in treating bone metastatic prostate cancer. Uh, and we've long known that the uh, PSA uh, test uh, can be deceptive in advanced disease patients. Uh, we've covered this in, in some of our previous both. Uh, videos and that you can have, uh, if the patient has cancer remaining in his body and the PSA is negative, uh, then you've got PSA negative disease. And time and again I've seen uh, patients who PSA has gone undetectable uh, and the bone scan is still highly active. Uh, so clearly there's hormone refractory PSA negative disease. So there are problems with PSA for following bone disease. Uh, an impo important adjunct to that is the bone-specific alkaline phosphatase. Uh, and this is released uh, by the osteoblasts that when they grow create the blastic bone lesion characteristic of, of this disease. Uh, and there are certain clinical situations where it really is much more useful than a PSA. Uh, Zofigo, radium-223. Uh, when you initiate radium-223, it's very common for the PSA to not go down, in fact, actually go up. But the bone-specific alkaline phosphatase is telling a different story. Uh, the cancer in bone is dying, and the blastic response is diminishing. So during Zofigo treatment, you might see the bone-specific alkaline phosphatase drop like a stone, even though the PSA is going up. Uh, and you can be clinically confident that you're likely heading into a, a a benefit from the Zofigo in that situation. The PSA will often not decline until the fourth or even after the sixth dose. Uh, 
uh, and then it'll go down. Uh, again, there's in, in this situation a lot of PSA negative prostate cancer cells. Yeah. Uh, so those are two very important uh, issues uh, to think about. Um, the second thing uh, is sometimes the treatments we use might make it hard to uh, see a response. Now we have the scans, uh, the technetium and sodium fluoride scan, which are picking a bone reaction to the, uh, to the cancer. Um, and then the CT scan picks up the change, the damage to the bone, uh, showing up as an increased amount of bone on the spot. So we'll often see patients where the technetium or sodium fluoride scan is negative. But the CT scan still shows extensive damage to the bone. Um, and for that bone to heal, cells called osteoclasts have to come in and eat up the damaged bone. Then the osteoblasts have to come in uh, and rebuild normal bone structure. Uh, we use drugs like uh, Zometa and Exgiva to prevent bone breakdown, and they work by blocking the osteoclast. Uh, so while they may be beneficial in terms of other aspects of patient management, these drugs could make uh, a patient appear to still have disease when truly is in remission. The scans are, ne the scans are negative. That is, the technetium or sodium fluoride bone scans are negative, but there's scar remaining on the CT scan. Uh, and that makes it difficult to know whether you're truly in complete remission or not. Um, in my clinical experience, if the technetium or sodium fluoride bone scan are negative and you just have CT detected injury, those patients tend to do very well. So my bias is a significant proportion of them have had a very deep tumor kill and may qualify for a complete remission. Uh, especially if the bone-specific alkaline phosphatase has returned to normal or even uh, low normal. Uh, but again, this is a controversial aspect uh, of this, this issue. In any case, those of you who have the news or I hope you appreciate it. Uh, uh, our two interviewees do a crackerjack job. Take care.